It's a real privilege and a pleasure for me to be here with you all this morning. I really enjoyed yesterday and, uh, and have been very impressed with the distance that many people have traveled to be here for this conversation that we're having. Uh, I feel some amount of pressure um, to carry on the conversation this morning and get us started. And so what I'd like to do is uh, spend a little bit of time really for us to start the conversation today thinking a little bit about how to think about this question that we've been discussing. And so I'm going to try to do that by um, starting a conversation with you to see if we can define what a calorie is really worth in a cow-calf system and then from that see if we can maybe move on and think about how to use that to drive innovation in these systems. So let's set the stage a little bit. We discussed this already, but I want to touch on it again, this idea that global population dynamics are a significant driver of our industry and, and all industries really around the world. But we, we know that the population is going to increase or continue to increase with a target of approximately 9 billion people uh, within about 35 to 40 years. Now, depending on where you look and, and what particular studies or projections you look at, that number could be as high as 10.5 billion or as low as 8.5 billion. And either way, it's significantly more people than are with us today. The interesting thing is that the average of those estimates shows about a 25% increase in global population, and yet we're forecasting the need for an 80 to 100% increase in, in protein supplies. Now, in a way, we can think that that's a, that's a really positive thing because that's a sign that the world as a whole is becoming more affluent. A significant number of people over the next 20 years will move out of poverty and into what you might think of as the lower middle class, whatever that might mean for their particular situation. The, the really important thing to us about that is, is that when people make that transition, the first thing they try to do is improve their diet. They try to consume more meat and more milk, and that means that the global demand for beef will increase at a rate much faster than the global increase in population. Now, that's a tremendous opportunity for the people in this room, but it comes with some constraints, creates a challenge. Land area may be the largest constraint. Our businesses typically revolve around large volumes of land that are generally less than suitable for other forms of agriculture. That provides the basis, the primary production in the supply chain for beef. But in high income nations like the United States, the European Union, and other developed countries around the world, the land area devoted to agriculture is actually declining. Now, some of the reasons for that are obvious. As those populations in those countries grow, the cities expand and more and more land is taken out of production. Particularly in the United States, and I'm going to say even more particularly perhaps in my state of Texas, a lot of that is competition from other uses. Now, we tend to talk about the recreational users of land, the people who purchase small pieces of land uh, for recreational purposes, and in Texas, Deer hunting and bird hunting are the, the top two on that list. But we can't forget the non-recreational consumption of land. And again, in our state, a significant driver is the increase in petroleum production. Along with this idea that we need to increase protein production from land, uh, the United States is also poised to become a net exporter of petroleum products. Now, that's a fairly interesting situation and creates lots of additional global dynamics. But in our state, it also means that land is becoming increasingly competitive to obtain. And so that's the, the challenge maybe in, in high income nations. In low income nations, it's a mixed bag. In fact, if you look on average through the World, World Bank, um, on average in low income nations, the land use for agriculture is remaining flat as a percentage of their total land available. Now, about half of the countries are trying to increase land and agricultural production to increase food supplies, which we might view as a positive. The other half are actually declining, and most of that is because of political instability or other economic constraints that prevent them from expanding. And so, if we look at the ends of the spectrum, the low-income nations and the high-income nations appear to be land-constrained, 
for either political reasons or other economic competition, who can expand? Something to think about. There are some people in the world who can and who are aggressively expanding, and we need to be mindful of that in this country. So as we kind of ponder these global dynamics, we can ask ourselves, you know, is this a humanitarian crisis? So many of you might recall during several different eras of time, um, concerns about the growth of global population and the impending food crises that would occur. Now, I'm not saying there haven't been some food crises around the world over the past 50 years, but they've generally been short-lived and weather-related. We have never really had the, the global famine that has been projected numerous times throughout history, as far back as Thomas Malthus and Adam Smith. But we continue to face it, the real possibility that it could occur. So is this growing global demand for food, population expansion, land constraint, are we running out of room? And are people going to suffer for that? Is this a humanitarian crisis? Is it a sign of the apocalypse? Is it all fixing to come crashing down around us and this is the end? And maybe we need to find us a place in northwest Nebraska and hunker down, stay out of the way? Or is this a huge opportunity for people who are willing to innovate in their businesses? Now, I tend to be a fairly optimistic kind of a person, so I would say the latter. And so let's think about what we've been doing about this in the United States. And this is a, a graph, or at least a conversation that we started yesterday, um, looking at the U.S. beef cow inventory. And I'm confident this is a, a chart in some form or fashion that all of you have seen many times over the past several years. And we can indeed see this steady decline from, this, this year is actually 1975, but this steady decline since that time in beef cow numbers in the United States. And we tend to pay particular attention to the steady decline over the past several years that we associate with severe drought in some part of the country. It's moved around, but it's moved around in such a way to chase all the cows away at some point in time. What we don't think about, though, is that all we've really done is extend a trend line that started with a drought in 1996. And despite the fact that we have not been in severe continuing drought for the past 15 years, although some people would argue that we have been, um, that, that trend has continued downward uninterrupted. Even in the face of what we believe is an increase in global demand, these things seem to be counterindicated. So that 11% decline over the past several years, and if we look at Texas in particular, that decline is even more precipitous, a 28% decrease in the last 10 years in, the term, in terms of total cow numbers. But I went back and looked a little bit, and here's something interesting. So we, we know with certainty that this tremendous decline is due to drought, and in fact, all of this from this point forward is due to dry conditions in some part of the state. You can see that the pace of liquidation accelerated beginning in two, late 2010, early 2011, but we were in a drought liquidation for several years prior to that point in time. So I went back and looked at rainfall, and we can tie rainfall to each of these points on this graph. And perhaps the really interesting thing here is, is that th this one is, is a period in time that was referenced uh, yesterday. This is the drought of the 1950s. And um, my parents and my grandparents, uh, this is the reference point for all weather events that have ever occurred in the history of mankind. <laughs> and if you look, it had a substantial negative effect on cow populations in the state. This dip in, in the mid-60s was maybe partially weather-related, but as much market-related as anything else. But if we compare the rate of decline and liquidation in the, the middle 2000s compared to the 1950s, it's actually been much more significant and severe over the past few years. Although, arguably, we've been, done a much better job of coping with drought during this past episode. Interesting little set of trends. 
The other interesting thing that I'd point out to you is that since the mid-1970s that Dr. Eaton alluded to yesterday, and the, this, was, this was a double catastrophe of drought and significantly bad market conditions at the same time, but since that time, we've never recovered from any drought event in terms of cow population in Texas. A lot of that's been attributed to this competition for land that we spoke about a moment ago. So when we think about these dynamics in the cow population rather than the human population, can the United States meet the demand that we anticipate globally? The market seems to indicate expansion. Calf prices are extraordinarily high, high enough in fact that people upstream in the supply chain perhaps hope that we will expand rather rapidly so that they can sustain their supplies, um, but yet we don't have expansion. And is it solely because of drought? Are there other limits to growth? Land availability is, is the number two on my list. Access to capital is becoming increasingly problematic or the diversion of capital to other enterprises. Again, particularly in our state with a, a rapid expansion in drilling and development, a lot of capital has been deployed in other directions. Now, that capital may return to agriculture once, once it's uh, had its turn on the drill rig, you might say. There's also perhaps a much larger risk premium for entry today than there was even in previous episodes of drought. And so this question about whether or not our industry is prepared to expand and meet this demand is one that I also think is relevant to our conversation of yesterday and today. The second question is, even if we are prepared to expand our increases in production of the magnitude that we've talked about, a doubling of global meat production, is that feasible? And so again, I'm gonna kind of look at a little history. So this is the chart we just looked at a moment ago. I'm gonna to add to it a bit, because this is cow numbers, but that's US beef production. So this paints a slightly different picture of our population dynamics on the cow herd side when we look at the fact that despite these several dramatic depopulation events that have occurred in time, the long-term trend line in beef output is steadily increasing. And if we divide one by the other, so this uh, yellow line on the graph here is a measure, a rough measure, granted, of efficiency, and it's simply the pounds of beef output divided by the number of beef cows. Now I left dairy cows out and some of that beef output is from dairy cows, but I figure that we'll allow the dairy industry to distort the picture a bit because it generally favors this graph. So I'm gonna leave it alone. But if we look back here at these liquidation events that occurred um, before the middle, you know, around before World War II, so think uh, Dust Bowl event, this is this liquidation event, um, we didn't really have a precipitous decline in beef output. But when we get up here to the 1950s, and so what we see is this, this kind of tapering of, of the cow population um, right around during World War II, and then a rapid expansion until the mid-1950s in the liquidation, primarily due to drought, but also due to market, because this is national, not regional. But we see this continuing increase in productivity. During this period of time, the increases in productivity are strictly due to expansion of the cow herd. The way we expanded production was to add cows. But as we move forward in time, and we get to the 1980s, significant liquidation event, but a steady increase in productivity. And so that's represented by a very steep increase in this measure of efficiency, suggesting that during that period of time, technical innovation is what expanded production at the expense of beef cows. And when we finally look out here closer to present day, so from, I'm, I'm actually kind of going from this 1996 liquidation event which was also exacerbated by fairly low cattle prices and the first time ever $5 corn, right? And so during that period of time, as we started to liquidate cows, we again continued to increase beef output. And in fact, 
although the increases are rather modest, the declines are fairly significant. So again, the efficiency trend line continues upward. So can we meet this challenge of increasing global meat supply? Well, if we look back to the 1950s time period, we doubled beef production in less than 10 years. And as we move forward in time, of course, doubling becomes much more challenging. But even in this most recent, um, or during the 1980s, we increased beef production by about 25% in spite of a 25 to 30% reduction in cow numbers over a fairly long span of time. Kind of interesting to think about. So here's the challenge, and this is kind of where I'm going to be pointed for the, the rest of my allotted time this morning is how do we capitalize on this apparent opportunity? How do we make something out of the chance to put more beef into the market around the world, not just necessarily in the United States? And how do we meet that need in spite of these various constraints that we've described in terms of land availability, um, access to capital, recapitalization of the industry, et cetera? And the, the two ways that are the most likely to yield beneficial results are through innovation in primary production systems, so cow-calf systems primarily, because most of the efficiency gains that we observed in the previous graph really came on the terminal ends of the supply chain. Those have really been technical innovations and adoption of technologies and strategies from weaning onward that have accelerated that amount of output. There has been some genetic improvement, obviously, that has um, increased output across all phases of production, but the majority of those efficiency gains can be attributed to the application of technology for growing and finishing cattle, not necessarily changes in technology in primary production. So the second mechanism is intensification. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I feel like over the last decade at least, the idea of intensification in agriculture has garnered a fairly negative connotation. That in this room, I might, it, it might be fairly safe for me to talk about that, but outside this room, just on the street with John Q. Public, the idea that I would recommend intensification tends to yield some fairly negative feedback. Would y'all agree with that? Here's a really interesting thing. The National Academy Press, the National Academy of Science, released a report a year or two ago. And after a fairly exhaustive study with a panel of people who weren't necessarily biased in the same ways that I might be, their conclusion was that the only answer that had any hope of being environmentally sustainable was for agriculture to intensify dramatically. And that through dramatic intensification of agricultural production, we could in fact meet the growing demand for global food and do that at 30% the environmental cost that it would take if we did it through more extensive means. Because the only way to do it through more extensive means means to take more land out of other forms of production, deforestation, etc and that the environmental consequences of extensive production to meet our food demands will be catastrophic. It's kind of a different view on that little slice of heaven too, isn't it? So I would say it's unsustainable for us not to consider intensification strategies. In fact, just a little sidebar here. Um, yesterday, I believe it was Dr. Ying that said that maybe we should have called this something besides confinement cow feeding system. So you'll notice that I will use the term intensive or intensified or intensification rather than confinement. So now I'm back on. That was a lot of little sidebar for the morning. I think it's a definite improvement. <laughs> I, I, I do what I can, sir. So as we've kind of been considering these questions in College Station, our group um, has tried to kind of grapple with this, and it's kind of a sticky thing to grapple with, to be honest. It's fairly large and lots of moving parts and not many square corners to grab onto. But our idea is, is that what we want to do is foster innovation in beef cattle systems because we do want to enhance the global competitiveness of United States agriculture. We believe that the United States is poised, capable, and will benefit mightily from remaining the global leader in agricultural technology and production. 
And the ways that we think we can do that that are specific to this case are to improve in economic and environmental sustainability with strategic intensification strategies. That's how we can achieve these goals. And that doing that will also yield increases in land use efficiency, to some degree relieving that constraint of access to additional land to expand production. And finally, in order to make any of these things actually usable, that we must develop along the way some sort of decision support strategies that allow managers and other land users and agricultural producers the opportunity to make well-informed decisions about which strategy they will select. There is certainly no one-size-fits-all answer. So rather, what we would like to do is propose a framework where we can create a functional description of these systems that is some, to some degree universal that will allow us to have this conversation over time in a way that is translatable among regions, among resource uh, supply chains, and allow us to identify the best opportunities to innovate in the system. What we'd really like to do is uncover the high leverage points, and that's what every system person talks about, right? How do you find the magic lever that you can move this much and move the world? And finally, to create that consistent platform for decision making, because the only thing I'm truly certain of is that all the things I've talked about so far will be different in 10 years. And so the, the constraints will change, the situation will change, and we need to have a system that is resilient to that and that can adapt to those changes as they occur. So what we're gonna propose is that we use caloric energy as the currency for these system transactions. That gives us a way to talk about it across regions, across systems, and across resource platforms. And so what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about the use of that framework. And if you'll bear with my little cartoon here for a minute, this is how I'm going to describe my baseline system for my example this morning. If we think about um, this, this sort of fundamental paradigm of nutrition, that we have nutrient supply and nutrient demand, and the balance between those two determines productivity. Fairly straightforward. Except what I'm going to propose to you is that we're going to talk about a ranch for a little while this morning, and this ranch is exactly perfectly properly stocked. The number of cow units on this ranch are exactly the number that are able to harvest the forage that is grown there, or the calories from that forage, in a continuous manner such that the ranch continues to produce that same level of calories over a span of years with some obvious variance for rainfall, et cetera, in time, but that generally speaking, we've put this ranch at steady state. Everybody okay with now? You can all say that doesn't really happen that way, Sawyer, and I'll say you're right, it doesn't, but this is just an example. And we're all okay? And so this ranching system that's in balance, this harvestable calorie supply that I'm talking about is equal to the calorie demanded by the cows because the branch is in balance. The system is in steady state. And so calorie supply is equal to calorie demand is equal to the requirements of the cow. The cows are also in steady state. They maintain a perfectly stable level of production based on the amount of calories that are produced and harvested. Everybody's good? It's just an example, okay? Now, the other assumption that I'm going to make is that we can translocate calories that are produced on the ranch. And we might do this in several ways. The further west you are, the more likely it is we do this by stockpiling forage. We grow a lot more grass in one part of the year than we grow in another part of the year, but that grass can accumulate, stand, and we consume it at a later point in time. What we've really done is we've moved the consumption of the calories, we've dislocated the consumption from the production. The other way we might do that, particularly if we're a little further east or south, is we'll allow the forage to grow when it grows rapidly and we'll harvest it and store it as hay or silage. If this is a diversified operation where we also farm, we might also include crop residues here. I'm saying that we're going to include all of the calories that are produced within this system however they're produced and whenever they're produced, but we will not count any calories that are produced outside the system. Again, the ranch is in steady state, consumes what it produces year in, year out. 
Now, <clears throat> in order for us to kind of continue this talk about transaction, we need to describe the consumer. So um, I apologize for my color choices here. I mean, I don't really apologize for the maroon and white color choices, but they're not showing up as well as they might this morning. But you can kind of generally see what we're talking about here. And what all I've done is I, I use the NRC model to estimate the nutrient requirements or the energetic requirements for a 1,200 pound Brangus cow throughout a production year. I have this cow calving in March, um, although it doesn't really matter. So, but I have her calving in March, weaning a calf at about 205, 210 days of age, and then being uh, dry but gestating for the balance of the year until she gets back to March to calve again. The bottom chunk here represents her maintenance requirements, which you can see declines at weaning as her metabolic rate declines. The, this maroon section here is energy requirements for the growth of a fetus, which doesn't really begin to accelerate until the third trimester of pregnancy. The white area is energy required for lactation. And then the gray bar that is actually a constant addition to all these, it looks like it gets smaller here, but that's an optical illusion, is the activity that the NR, or excuse me, the requirement that the NRC predicts this cow would utilize for activity since she is grazing rather than standing in a dry lot. So base nutrient requirements. Now I'm gonna put that in numerical form because um, it's gonna make it more convenient for me to talk about and it's all about me this morning. So. If I look at that March through October time, so think calving through weaning, this is when the cow is nursing a calf, uh, 245 days, because I actually want to start about 30 days prior to calving in my calculations here. And her cumulative energy demand during that period of time is about 3,700 megacalories of NEM. And now if you prefer to think about TDN, they're essentially the same number. From that November to February time frame, after she dries off, 120 days in time, a little less than 1,600 megacalories of total energy required. And so we can establish this total energy demand for this system at just under 5,300 megacalories per cow. Now, what I've tried to do here is put an enterprise budget together so that we can define how valuable these calories are in this system. This is absolutely unintelligible from where you sit and even from where I stand. So it is in the, in the symposium proceedings, but I've taken the important parts of it and tried to make them a bit more readable. So where it says readable cow-calf budget up here, that, that's literal. And what I, all I really want us to look at here is that each of these cows in my, in my budget, which is not the same as your budget, and the wonderful thing about the way we're trying to put this together is you can put whichever numbers you prefer in your budget. But in our budget, this cow, the average revenue per cow, so this incorporates the fact that not every cow weans a calf. It incorporates the fact that we do generate some revenue from the sale of cull animals, and we fail to generate revenue from heifers that we retain as replacements. It incorporates a 25% replacement rate on bulls, so I turn over a fourth of my bull battery every year. And uh, so we've tried to, to make this a, as comprehensive an estimate as we can, but the total revenue per cow exposed in this system is $660, with variable costs of just under $400 and fixed costs of just under $200. Those numbers might look a little bit upside down when we think about the cost and value of land, but we do have land represented in here with an opportunity cost number, not a market valuation. Okay, again, we can, you can fix this however you like in your budget. So this cow has a net return to management and risk of just under $100 per head. Sound like reasonable numbers for today's environment to y'all? Again, not necessarily the best you could do, not necessarily the worst, we're trying to shoot for the middle. And we can also look over here, I'm kind of saying that this is a 500 cow outfit, this steady state perfect ranch we invented, and so we can total out each of these lines by multiplying them by 500. That's all I've done there. Now, if we want to think about how valuable the calorie is, 
then all we really need to do is agree that value in this case is the revenue generating potential of that unit of energy. That's its value. It's, what, it's how much money it can produce because we tend to want to talk about value in terms of, of dollars. And so the way we're going to express value here is dollars per calorie. And since I know that revenue was $667 per cal and she required just under 5,300 calories, then the value of calories in this system is just under 13 cents per megacal. That's how valuable they are. That has nothing to do with what they cost. Have you ever paid more for something than it was worth? I'm pretty sure I did it last weekend at a sale barn. But have you ever paid less for something than it was worth? I may have done that the week before at the same sale barn, right? So the value of something and its cost in the marketplace are not necessarily the same thing. So we're only talking about value. Now, what we might ask is, can we change the value of those calories? And the answer is yes. In this system, this steady state system we described, if we change something about the system, such as the price of calves, then by definition, we will change the value of a calorie. So that means that the value of the calorie is subject to market risk. If we change other output functions of the system, we might also change the value of the calorie. If output goes up, we generate more revenue on the same calorie base. We made the calories more valuable. If value go, or rather if output goes down, then the value of the calorie might decline. We can also change the value of the calorie if the demand for those calories is reduced, as long as we reduce output by a lesser amount. The important thing here is that if we, is what I'm really saying is if we change efficiency of the cow, we have a tremendous opportunity to change the value of the calorie. We can make the calories more valuable by changing the efficiency of the cow. Now, we might also decide to apply some calories from outside the system. And here we're starting now to talk about intensification. We're no longer going to allow this system to remain in its glorious steady state without manipulation. We're going to do something to it. We're going to haul some calories in in excess of those that the ranch could produce on its own with the idea that by increasing the energy that we apply to the system, we can increase its output. And our strategy for this example is going to be that we're going to reallocate those base calories so that we use all of the base calories produced by the system while the cow is lactating. So that 245 day period, 30 days prior to calving to weaning, we're going to reallocate, rebalance our system so that all of that forage production is used during that 245 days. That leaves us short 120 days of feed. So we're going to import calories to cover that 120 days. So this is intensification. Whether we put the cows in confinement to accomplish that goal is a resource dependent question. We could just as easily do it on grass traps. We could do it with those cows on pasture. So long as we don't compromise the future ability of those pastures to continue to produce calories. Everybody with me? Okay. So here's what it looks like if we compare those two systems. That mark, this is the base case that we described. Remember, 5,300 total calories produced and also demanded because the system's in steady state. And I'm just going to take those 5,300 calories and use them all up March through October. That means there's no forage demand for calories or because there's no forage supply of calories now during that period of time. So I can add some additional calories to balance the demand. Now, what this means is, is that I've actually increased head count to be able to utilize all of those calories during that shorter period of time. And in this example, by relocating about a third of the year, I actually increased head count by just under 43%. So this 500 cow outfit is now a 713 cow outfit. <coughs> But efficiency has not changed because I have not changed output nor have I adjusted caloric demand. However, if we remove activity 
from that cow by placing her into closer quarters, I probably do reduce total caloric demand and therefore increase the efficiency of the system. In fact, as I go from no reduction because of change in activity down to 100% of what the NRC suggests that demand is, which is about two megacalories per day, if you're wondering. And I'm gonna be honest with you, I have relatively little faith in that number. And that's why I did this little sensitivity analysis here. What if we're wrong? What if it's only half of that amount? Well, that still changes the total amount of feed calories that I need by a little under 10%, and it still changes the total caloric demand of the system relative to the number of cows by 2.5%. So I gain some efficiencies even if that change for activity requirement is rather small. Some things that I did not consider in this example, but that we should consider, is that other efficiency gains may accrue. If there is an efficiency gain due to limit feeding, as was suggested yesterday, the overall effect of that is probably something less than 2%. However, if we use ionophores for either all or part of this duration, we can probably change, effectively reduce the caloric demand by increasing the caloric value, if you will, of the forage by approximately 8%, and I've just taken an average there are several published reports. So what's it worth for us to change? Well, we said we went from 500 to 713 cows, that's that 43% change in inventory. I did that with a 5% reduction, I'm taking that most uh, liberal estimate of energy change, 5% reduction in energy required per cow from 5,300 down to just over 5,000. And here's the total calories required for the system. They went up by 35%, but head count went up by 42. So we leveraged the system. We gained some efficiencies here. Now, revenue per cow in my model didn't change. Output per cow hasn't changed. I have changed nothing about the production pattern other than her energy demand through management. And as a result, total revenue increased by 43%, even though we only increased caloric demand 35. So by, def my, by my definition, those calories are now more valuable. Okay, I'm gonna kinda, I'm, I'm getting really close to the end. Um, and most of y'all are thankful for that, but you don't have to tell me that right now. What I want us to look at real quickly, this, this table is not in your proceedings, but in, in the context of trying to create some decision support or some, a framework from which we can make decisions, what I wanted to talk about was, okay, we've defined how valuable it is and we can do this. Is it worth doing? So now we do have to consider the cost of those additional calories. And so what I've done here is I made adjustments in the non-feed variable cost. I do gain some economies of scale with this increase in headcount. That, that dilution is more apparent when I consider fixed costs. And the fixed cost base is reduced on a per cow basis by about the same proportion that I increased headcount, which makes sense. And, and so if I, if I go through here, and I'm going to tell you how I did it, you can do it how you like. I want to project a break-even cost for purchasing, those, purchasing and delivering those additional calories. And I've actually factored in the delivery cost into this non-feed portion because I included fuel depreciation on purchased equipment, et cetera, et cetera, there. But um, so this really becomes mostly ingredients. And I did this by taking, I, I wanted these two systems to generate the same rate of return to capital. So they have the same rate of return to the fixed cost per cow. So that means I actually have less revenue per cow here, but I've held rate of return constant. Does that make sense? So from an investment perspective, these are neutral. From a total yield perspective, this one obviously is somewhat larger. It yields a little bit more cash. The question is, can I actually feed those cows for that amount of money? So I can now consider whether or not the cost of those calories is less than their value. So when I take this number and divide it by 
the actual total calories required, it says that I can't afford to pay more than about eight cents per megacal. Again, based on Dr. Kloppenstein's presentation yesterday and uh, Carlos' presentation yesterday, you might recall that the least expensive byproducts on an energy basis that they discussed were somewhere around 10 cents per unit of energy. And so what that says is that in this system that I have so laboriously described to you this morning, I can't make it work today. Does that mean I can't make it work tomorrow? No. In fact, if I, if I can increase productivity of the cows, I'm only two cents away right now, right? If I can change productivity of the cows by a relatively small margin, or if I can find the right ingredient or deliver it in the right way, then I can realize the benefits of this change. What's it going to take for me to do that? What's it going to take for me to realize those little tweaks in productivity, et cetera? Innovation. And so those are really the things I want to leave you with today is that yes, this example doesn't consider every possibility, every technology that could be applied because what we really want to do is open the door to think about how we can apply the technologies that currently exist and identify technologies that need to be developed so that we can realize the efficiencies to be gained through partial intensification of these primary systems. Innovation in creating those efficiencies is possible. There are large opportunities to gain efficiency. And the opportunities in the marketplace are quite real if we can think of, figure out how to get it done. So this is just a little bit about where we're planning to go over the next 10 to 12 months in this research area. And I hope I haven't overly abused my time. There's no clock in the back of the room, so I could have talked for three hours. I have no idea. But with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I hope we got us off to a start today so the rest of our speakers uh, have a platform to stand on. And I had a fancy little movie stuck in here, but I couldn't make it work. And I'm not, I'm not technically savvy enough to make an Apple thing talk to a not Apple thing, apparently. So, so we'll give up on the movie. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. Because we have, we have a break, I think, in the next talk or so, and so maybe um, whenever we get to that break time, whoever's already spoken for the morning, we, we won't really have a panel, but we'll stand up here and be able to field some questions as the break starts. Does that sound all right with you, Dr. Cross? All right. So uh, if you have them, think about them, and hopefully somebody will talk after me that's smarter and can answer them for you. So thanks again for y'all's attention.